My wife Darby and I uh, will be going to Texas next week. You can be praying for us. Uh, I'll be going, continuing on in uh, doctoral studies at Dallas Seminary, so you can be praying for us. Pastor Tyler will be preaching the next two weeks uh, a really interesting series that you're going to have to come and listen to to find out what it's on. But, but I'm really excited. As, as Tyler said, what do you want me to preach on? I said, just preach what the Lord leads. And as he starts sharing these ideas, I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, come, uh, listen for the next two weeks. Please pray for Darby and I. Uh, we would appreciate your prayers. Uh, the first time we were in Dallas, we were sitting in a doctor's office. And the doctor looked at us with tears in her eyes. And she told us that our child would be born with one hand. And we didn't know what to think. And this was six years ago. That when we found out that our baby that we thought would have no problems whatsoever now would have one hand, we were hit. With staggering news, we didn't know we even had a process. We started thinking... Is it a boy or is it a girl? If it's a boy, is he going to be able to play sports? If it's a girl, is she going to be teased relentlessly at school? If it's a boy, how is he going to drive a stick, a stick shift? If it's a girl, how is she going to wear a wedding ring on her wedding day? And all these questions racing through our minds. And I remember we exited the doctor's office and we stopped in the hallway and the gray carpets and the gray walls matched our hearts and we just held each other and cried at the staggering news. Staggering news has a way of challenging our allegiance our allegiance to trusting in God and his promises, our allegiance to trusting in God and his promises, our allegiance to trusting God and his word. When we are hit with challenging news, there's something in our hearts that starts to waver. It starts to swing. It puts us right on the fence of trusting in God or not. I don't know if you've watched the news lately, but we talked a couple weeks ago about when the news about Twinkies came out, and everybody freaked out that there weren't going to be enough Twinkies. So everyone went out and, and bought a bunch of Twinkies. But you, now you read the news with shootings that happen and gun control, and people are packing out sports, uh, sports stores, buying all the bullets and assault rifles they can. There's something in our hearts that just wonders, am I going to have enough Am I going to be safe? Do I trust in my plans or do I put my trust in God? When that doctor sits down across from you and takes in a deep breath right before he tells you the bad news of test results, we're tempted to race home and to let Google solve our medical conditions but so many times that makes it so much worse. When we see a report on investments that have been made, or look at bank accounts, or we hear of this fiscal cliff, we're worried financially that we're not going to have enough, and so we start freaking out. That staggering news challenges our allegiance. Are we going to trust God to provide, or are we going to start taking matters into our own hands? In fact, I was at People's Bank in Ferndale talking to the teller, and she said that people are already starting to come in and to clear out their accounts. Now, when I just told you that news, did you think to yourself, ooh, should I be doing that too? <laughs> See, staggering news challenges our allegiance. We hear that one of our friends, a, a friend that we thought was dear to us, has been gossiping behind our back. Or we hear of criticism that other people have said about us. And we start thinking, am I really acceptable? And so we try to make everybody happy and overcommit and participate in activities that we know aren't right just to earn approval. 
Staggering news challenges our allegiance to God. We're going to talk in the Bible today. We're going to uh, talk about King Ahaz. And King Ahaz uh, found himself with some staggering news. And we're going to look at how he processed it. And within the story of King Ahaz is a very familiar uh, Christmas passage. And we'll get to it in just a little bit. But first of all, the story of Ahaz, it's a fascinating story. King Ahaz was 20 years old. And even as a young pastor, I think that's a young age to be a king. He's 20 years old and three years into his kingship, so he's 23, he's in his mid-20s, he finds out that his two enemies to the north are joining forces to come and to take over his territory, to demolish his kingdom, and to put someone else in his position. This kingdom that he had just started just years before now is threatened by the staggering news that his two enemies, who can't defeat him alone, but together pose a significant threat to Ahaz, threaten his kingdom. And he stands there wringing his hands. I imagine he's looking up at the wall that fortifies his city and he thinks, well, that, that wall looks pretty strong. It's pretty fortified. That, that wall will keep Judah safe, but even if that wall keeps us safe... Uh, they can still make us come out of our city if they cut off our water supply. So Ahaz goes to the main water supply of the city and he, he's looking at the wall and he's looking at this water supply and he's starting to worry, starting to freak out at the staggering news. And he, he's thinking the, the wall could protect us, but all they have to do is cut off this water supply and we won't last long before our whole kingdom is gone. And so God sends Isaiah the prophet. God sends Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah comes to Ahaz. And Isaiah brings his son. And in the Bible, names are a big deal. Names are a huge deal in the Bible. And so here Ahaz is worrying about what's going to happen, where, what he's going to do. And he's contemplating allegiance with Assyria. He's contemplating bringing in another party, bringing in another group of people to help him beat his enemies in the north. And Isaiah comes to him with his son. You know what his son's name is? His son's name is only a remnant will return. If I'm Ahaz, I don't want to hear that someone's bringing their son named only a remnant will return. I mean, he's worried that his people will be taken away from their kingdom and his whole kingdom will be demolished. And he hears that Isaiah is bringing his son with a message from the Lord that says only a remnant will return. Now, that's good news and bad news. It means that some will return, but only a remnant. And Isaiah says to Ahaz, Isaiah being the prophet speaking for God, says, Ahaz, don't worry. Put your trust in God. Don't worry about those two people up north. They don't pose a threat. In fact, those two people that, or those two uh, kingdoms that pose a threat, the th very thing that you're worried about, Isaiah says, those are just like smoldering logs after a fire has gone out. They don't pose a real threat. And they may glow, there may be some sparks, but you don't have to worry about those two folks up north. Put your trust in God. In fact, Isaiah uses uh, the word, this great word, uh, firm, to address Ahaz's heart. The Bible tells us in, in Isaiah chapter 7 that when the king Ahaz heard this news of his, uh, the armies attacking, that his heart shook. And Isaiah says, you need to be firm. If you have your Bibles and you're reading along as I tell this story, uh, circle, highlight, underline that word I, I, that the king's heart shook. That word is a fascinating word if you study it. it it's translated elsewhere as stagger or waver or swinging to and fro. The very news caused King Ahaz's heart to, to waver. Am I, am I going to trust God to protect Judah or do I have to take matters into my own hands? Do I believe God's promises and do we follow God or should I align with Assyria? 
And so Isaiah says, God says through Isaiah rather, Ahaz, you need to be firm in order to stand firm. He says, you, you need to be firm in your faith in God. If you're going to stand firm, the condition of your heart is going to stand firm. And I've told the story, I've paraphrased uh, a large section of scripture. We're going to jump into Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. Some of you have been reading along, which I love. It warms my heart so much because we are a church that wants to believe what the Bible says. I love you reading along to make sure, is, is this really what happened? Let's continue getting on in the word of God. Uh, Isaiah says, you need to, if you're not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. If you don't make your faith in God firm, your heart cannot be firm. Your heart will continue to waver and stagger and swing to and fro. Verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz through Isaiah. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol... Or high as heaven. God is saying, Ahaz, you don't believe me? You don't believe me that things are going to be okay? That the, these two people in the north you don't need to worry about? Okay, fine. Fine, Ahaz. Ask for a sign. It can be at, at the bottom of the place where the dead are. Or it can be to the top place of heaven. Anything, any size. Ask for any sign you want, Ahaz. I love Ahaz's response. Ahaz piously, I imagine, stands up there and puffs up his chest and says, <laughs> I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. He hides behind this pious, hypocritical language. Because the very thing he's quoting, don't put the Lord your God to the test, means just trust God to do what he'll says what he says he will do. Don't ask a sign from him. Just trust in God. Have allegiance with God. Commit to God. But Ahaz rips it out of context and says, oh no. Trust me, if God asks you to ask him for a sign, I think that's a green light to say, oh, okay. <laughs> but Ahaz doesn't because he doesn't believe. He doesn't have faith that God will do what he says he'll do. And you know, you know how I know that the Lord isn't happy with Ahaz's response? Read with me. Verse 13, And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men? Now, weary men, weary people is one thing, but also, did you notice it says that you weary my God also? In modern day terms, I imagine Isaiah would say something like this. Cut it out, Ahaz. God's tired of this. You say you're not going to ask God for a sign like you really believe that God is there and important, but the way you're acting is proving otherwise. To say that we trust God, but not to be obedient, is a contradiction. To say that we believe God and to not be obedient, to not commit, to not trust his promises is a contradiction. Like your mama may have said, actions speak louder than words. We see Ahaz as actions. Now look, there, it's fascinating that staggering news challenges our allegiance but good news, and we'll get to this in, in the text right here. But good news, God's news, encourages commitment. If staggering news challenges our allegiance, God's news encourages commitment. When we look around, when Ahaz looks around at some staggering news, scary times, it challenges allegiance. There's something in Ahaz's heart and in our heart that starts to wonder starts to worry. But 
God's news encourages commitment. Read with me uh, in verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself, whenever you get to a therefore, what do you ask? What's it there for? That's right. What's it there for? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Ahaz, you know what? God asked you to ask for a sign. You threw up this pious, contradictory language that you're not going to ask for a sign. You know what? God's still going to give you a sign, Ahaz. God's good like that, isn't he? God's still going to give you a sign. Here's the sign, Ahaz. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name. Again, names being important. Right? The first name is only a remnant will return. The second name of a child is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Ahaz, God is going to give you a sign. The baby will be born. And that will be God's sign that he is with you and you do not need to fear. Now, when we first read this, when we read it to our kids at Christmas time, uh, who's the virgin that we think it refers to? Mary, that's right. Uh, it does. It was completely fulfilled. It was ultimately fulfilled in Christ. But when we come to a text, as we've been talking about, when we come to a text, we ask, what did it mean back then? What does it mean for all time? And what does it mean now? So we look at when Isaiah was talking to Ahaz, and he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive of a, a, and bear a son, and uh, you'll call his name God with us. Uh, that term for virgin doesn't mean uh, necessarily virgin, virgin, like we think of virgin. It can sim simply mean a young maiden or a young woman that's of marriable age. Some woman that may, people may have even known to whom Isaiah was referring. He says, there is going to be a young maiden that will bear a child. Is anyone a little uncomfortable right now? Like, what? Pastor's medicine with the virgin birth of Christ? Again, it was ultimately fulfilled in Christ, but it was fulfilled in the short term. This term, a young maiden. There's a term for virgin virgin, like we think of virgin, that wasn't used. There's also a term for girl in the Hebrew that wasn't used. It's this term that can be used both ways, for both young maiden and for virgin. And so in Ahaz's time, indeed it was fulfilled several years later. There was a, a child born. It was a sign to Ahaz that God was there. Ahaz didn't have anything to worry about. And then, when Matthew uses it later on in the Bible, in the ultimate fulfillment of the, the Messiah, uh, there's a word used there that means virgin, virgin. Virgin. That there's like no possible way of getting pregnant, virgin. All right, but in the original Isaiah text, it was this, this young maiden of, of marriable age. So it's fulfilled in the short term, to tell Ahaz and everyone around him, hey, God's with us. We don't have anything to worry about. Our allegiance is to God in this tough time. But God uses it later on to have its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. God says, I will be with you. You don't have to worry. And then, ultimately in Christ for all time, he says, I'm with you. Always. And you don't have to worry. And then Isaiah goes on to talk about this child. Verse 15, he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. That's why this is a, a double fulfillment of the prophecy. There's this short-term fulfillment to prove God's long-term commitment. That This sign to Ahaz, Isaiah is saying, Ahaz, there's, there's this young woman that's going to have a child. Before that child is old enough to know right from wrong, so maybe 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, we think right now it must be age 13, but around that time they're thinking like, I don't know, 11 to 14, somewhere around that time. Before that child is that old, uh, you'll have nothing to worry about. 
Those, the, the things up north that you're worried about, those two people coming and attacking you, you'll have nothing to worry about. God's going to work it all out. When he says uh, that this young boy will eat curds and honey. It, uh, curds and honey are, are very, very, uh, they're delicacies reserved for royalty or people in power. And there are, are such a few amount of people that will return. Remember, only a remnant will return. Such a few amount of people that will return that even kids are eating like royalty because there are so few people. And we see later on, and imagine the original Hebrew audience hearing this story of Ahaz. And there's a, there's a sign, there's a child that will be born. And then that child is born from a young woman. But then in chapter 9, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and then in chapter 9 it says, a child is born to us. And then all of a sudden, people start thinking, wait a second, wasn't that prophecy already fulfilled? But then chapter 9 goes on and talks about wonderful counselor. Another famous Christmas passage we use in Isaiah 9. That this child is special. It's already been fulfilled, but not yet. Ultimately, it's fulfilled in Christ. God's message to us, when we hear staggering news, encourages our commitment. It encouraged Ahaz, and it encourages us today. Because the virgin birth of Christ, what we celebrate at Christmas, is God's message to us from that point on. God is with us. That we have connection to God. Ahaz thought his problem were the two kings up north coming against him. We think that our problem is not having enough Twinkies or being worried about our economy. Or what's going to happen to a retirement account or our health insurance? God's message to us today, when we hear staggering news that causes our heart to waver, our challenge is to commit to the king. Commit to the king. When you hear that staggering news, the doctor says it's cancer. Instead of going home and relying on Google to solve our problems, we commit to the king. Say, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out for your glory, but I know you will. When you hear of financial problems or you read the news that the stock market took a significant dip, Instead of going and checking all your accounts and trying to figure out how much money you've lost or how much money you'll have in the future and trying to control, <sighs> commit to the king. Say, God, I'm committing my pocketbook. I'm committing my wallet. I'm committing my bank account. I'm committing financially to you, God, because ultimately all the resources are yours. And I know I'll have enough. So I'm committing that to you, God. I'm releasing that to you. When you find out that that best friend or that spouse has been lying to you and you've just uncovered deception or they've hurt you deeply, deeper than most people know, instead of throwing a pity party and spiraling down out of control, Commit that relationship to God. Commit the forgiveness process to the king. Instead of making people pay for how they've wronged us, we would be so much better off if we committed that forgiveness to the king. Saying, God, I want to make this person pay for how they've hurt me, but you forgave me, and I know you tell me to forgive others, God, so I'm committing this relationship to you. Commit to the king. When you hear staggering news that there's yet another shooting or there's yet another financial crisis or there's some uh, viral outbreak 
Instead of panicking and freaking out and going and buying the masks and getting the shots, and we need to pre- be preventative. There's nothing wrong with being smart. But instead of freaking out, wondering if you and your family and everyone you love is going to die, commit to the king. God, you're in control. You know the future. God knows the future. And I'm glad that we can be here today because this week the world was supposed to end. And we're still here. God has given us more time and he's not done with this world yet. God's message to us in the birth of a savior, a virgin birth of a savior is, I am with you. I am in control. Give your allegiance to me, not the way you do things. And this isn't just a nice idea. There are serious consequences if we don't commit to the king. There are serious consequences if we take matters into our own hands. Have you ever had a situation where you're lying in bed and you're running through what could happen in your head with a certain situation? And you're you're saying, okay, well, God, what if this happens and this happens and this happens and then this and this and this would happen and then this and this and this would happen? So I'm going to take action right here. And we plan all these solutions to problems that haven't even occurred. Have you ever acted on those? Have you ever taken matters into your own hand and made things a whole lot worse? Ahaz is sitting there. He's heard this this, uh, prophecy from the Lord from Isaiah. And, and Ahaz decides, instead of listening to Isaiah and put, committing to God, he decides to align with Assyria. Assyria comes and, and conquers its enemies to the north, and Ahaz may think, all right, woo this is great. But do you know what? His plans backfired on him. The very uh, allegiance that he had made turned on him, backfired on him. And he thought that his problem was the two kingdoms up north, but really his problem was Assyria. The major threat was Assyria. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that uh, Ahaz had a, took gold and silver from the God's temple. Resources that were dedicated to God, he took those resources from the temple and he gave them to Assyria. Things got so bad spiritually in Judah that they had to shut the temple down. And Ahaz erected idols to other gods on all the high places of their countryside. And Judah plummeted. My kids and I were out hiking. And uh, if you've ever been to the Samish Outlook, uh, you know that they have this, this little cedar fence railing and then about, I don't know, maybe a 200-foot drop. I don't know, it makes the story better. It was a 2,000-foot drop. I don't know. And so... We, uh, we, we're there hanging out and all of a sudden there's a bee that's buzzing around and my kids start freaking out that this bee is going to buzz them and so they're going, ah, daddy, daddy, the bee, the bee, the bee and they start running towards the edge of this cliff and they thought the problem was the bee but the problem was the drop. Friends, we think our problem is all this staggering news of what if and what might happen but our true enemy is Sin. Our true enemy is Satan. Our true enemy is the consequences of Seth, the consequences of sin, which is eternal death. And God has conquered that. And so why would we align ourselves with someone or something else when God has conquered the true problem in our lives? Brothers and sisters, imagine with me if we committed to the king. Instead of tossing and turning in in bed, worrying about a situation, what should we choose? What does God want me to do? Will God provide for me? What if we could rest at night? Committing our finances, our calendars, our plans to the king. Saying, God, it doesn't make sense to me now, but I know you're in control. Imagine how God would release us of burdens that we carry against other people if we committed forgiveness to people who have hurt us to the king. 
Imagine, in a nation that is buying bullets by the bucket load and Twinkies galore. Imagine a nation that is freaking out at all the bad news that's happened. A nation that hears about it instantly through the internet. A nation that hears bad news and freaks out. Imagine if that nation started seeing God's people. The only people that aren't freaking out. The only people that are calm and collected. Imagine a nation that sees God's church committed to the king. No matter what circumstances, no matter what staggering news hits us, that our allegiance stays with him. Darby and I had nothing to worry about when we were standing there in the doctor's office. You know, you know our family. You know our sweet little daughter, Kate. We had nothing to worry about. In fact, we had a, a Christmas uh, sing-along here. And, and I loved it because Darby and I were worried, well, what if kids make fun of her and she's really shy and she's really quiet and what if she has no friends and nobody likes her and we started worrying about all this stuff and it was, it was so touching to me to see her come up on stage and take a microphone right in the mouth and start singing songs, using hand motions. And she didn't care. Darby and I had nothing to worry about. We saw her dancing last night at the Mount Baker Theater. And this little girl that we were afraid of would have no self-confidence, that would have no friends, that would be embarrassed, was one of the first ballerinas out on the stage when it was her turn. Brothers and sisters, our real problem isn't the circumstances around us. Our real enemy is Satan. Our real problem is sin. Staggering news will hit you. In fact, just a show of hands, who has been hit with staggering news? Whose heart is wavering right now? Anybody brave enough to raise your hand? I know there's some staggering news that I've been hit with lately. Okay, show of hands. Anybody uh, that's been hit with staggering news this year? In the last three years? Yeah. If you haven't been hit with staggering news, it's going to happen. It may even happen tomorrow. It may happen today when you turn your phones back on after the service. You get a text message. Something bad has happened. Staggering news abounds. What are you going to commit to the king today? Today? 